Hi. In today's episode we're gonna continue our study of basic elements of polygon packing method. Specifically, we're gonna talk about ridge and axial creases and its mutual relationship. So, let's start. Let's start with the ridge crease, with its definition. Unlike the hinge crease, the ridge crease is a line or a crease that radiates outwardly from a polygon's center. To be sure you understand the definition, let's see our simple example once again. Can you recognize it? Now, let's unfold it and pause the footage. Now we can see all the creases. Hinge creases are specially highlighted in yellow. But the creases that are of most interest to us are the ones that run at a 45 degree angle. Do you see them? I can immediately tell you that these lines are ridge creases. By definition, ridge creases are lines that run at an angle of 45 degrees. How exactly we are supposed to fold ridge creases, I will show you in a moment, but before that, I'd like to show you how to define a ridge crease for every single flap. So, the rule is as follows. From every flap tip, therefore from every center of a circle, four ridge creases have to radiate, in four directions, at an angle of 45 degrees. To understand this better, let's take a look at this small polygon. Let's add a circle first. Now, let's encircle the circle with a polygon, and then draw four lines that run from the circle center to the polygon corners. These lines are the ridge creases of this polygon. The fact that three out of four creases are out of the paper, in principle changes nothing. It just means that three of these creases will not be used. That's all. Now, we can show this principle one more time, on another flap. Please watch it carefully. We add a circle again, then a polygon that encircle the circle, and finally ridge creases at a 45 degree angle. Lastly, all the creases outside the paper are erased. As simple as that. Now, we can repeat this procedure for larger flaps. The procedure is literally the same. Finally, let's go, at the risk of being boring, through the same procedure, for the smaller flap in the middle. In this case again, everything is the same. As you can see, the only significant difference is that we have to erase two, and not three creases. That is all. Everything else is the same. All the rules still apply. Now that we've learned how to define ridge creases, I can show you how to fold them. To make things less complicated, for the time being, we'll fold only two larger flaps. So, let's try to fold the first one. Do you see how a flap is being formed in the direction of the ridge crease? Pay attention to the fact that the ridge crease isn't completely straight. It goes up and down, along its whole length. Meaning it constantly changes its orientation. For now, just note this. Nothing more. We'll talk about it in the next episode. By the way, have you noticed how the hinge crease was folded into a single unit line? As we expected. Now, we can do this with another flap too. It's also collapsing into the direction of its ridge crease. I hope this is more or less clear. Now we know how to define and fold ridge creases of flaps. But what about rivers? Do rivers have ridge creases as well? The answer is of course, yes, they do, but the principle is a little bit different. To be able to show you this new principle, this new approach, we're gonna need a different base. One that has a more complex river, a river that isn't straight like in our first example. This is our new base. Take a good look at the number of flaps, their length and position. First, we have five flaps on one side of a river. Among them, one is distinctly longer. It's five units long. We also have three flaps on the other side of the river. Can you see them? Also, in between we have a river, but this time, it is only one unit wide. If we unfold the space, we will be able to see its crease pattern. Now, let's freeze the footage to make things more visible. First it would be clever to mark polygons that define flaps. Here they are. As you can see, three are grouped together. These yellow ones. The remaining polygons are also grouped together. 
Can you see how one of them is distinctly larger? So, everything is as it should be. Now, we can add ridge creases. I hope you can follow. Finally, we've come to the most interesting part, the river. This unused part in between the polygons is the river. You can see, this river is substantially more complex compared to the one in our previous example. This river is obviously not straight, as a matter of fact, it meanders from one end of the paper to the other. This inevitably raises a question, how something so complex can be reduced to a single square? Relatively easy. At every river bend we just have to add a ridge crease. As simple as that. So let's do it. Let's start from one end of the river. At the first bend we add one ridge crease. Now, we can add a second and a third one. Now, I can show you how to fold a base, simply to show you how to fold a whole river into a single square. But before doing that, I'd like to point out something else. Just like in the case of a river, a ridge crease as well, cannot appear or disappear in the middle of a paper, it has to be continuous. If that's not so, it means something's wrong. In other words, a ridge crease can be bent at as many places as you want to, but it cannot be discontinued. Also, take a look at how ridge creases of different polygons are added to one another to form one single continuous ridge crease. One more thing. Two ridge creases cannot intersect one another. If they meet at an intersection point, they have to bounce into the opposite directions. Remember this as a rule. This is very, very important. As you can see, we're slowly getting to understand various creases and their differences. Before we move on to explain the last of the creases, the axial crease, it would be appropriate to show how to fold our example, to show how to fold a more complex river. Let's slowly fold this base. You can see what's happening with the river. It is folding into a single square. Can you see it? Do you see now why ridge creases were needed inside the river? These ridge creases allow the river to fold into the single square, even though the river is not straight. I hope this is clear. This is important for you to understand. Let's do this one more time, just to be sure we understand the role of a ridge crease during the river folding. Is it clear now? This is more or less it. I hope you get the idea. Now, we have to define lines we call axial creases. If we want to fold a base, we need to have axial creases too. However, since we've already folded two bases, it is logical to assume that axial creases are already there. And they are. Axial creases fully coincide with creases that make up the grid, which is why we have had them all along, since the very beginning. But there is a small problem. Two axial creases cannot intersect one another. So, if we look at the grid, it is obvious that we have too many creases. At least half of the creases, both vertical and horizontal, have to be erased or at least ignored. I hope you can see the ridge creases, they are highlighted. Ridge creases define which axial creases are only a part of a grid, and as such can be ignored, and which are the real ones and have their purpose. Okay, let's start with the rules that can be applied on all crease patterns with only basic elements. Crease patterns with advanced elements, such as Pythagorean stretch, require a little bit more complex rules. So, for time being the rule is as follows. A change from a horizontal into a vertical axial crease, and of course vice versa, happens whenever an axial crease intersects a ridge crease. In other words, on one side of a ridge crease, an axial creases are always horizontal, and on the other side they are always vertical. There cannot be both types of axial creases on the same side of a ridge crease. Think about it. A direct consequence of this rule is that on the crease pattern, there are distinct areas of only horizontal or only vertical axial lines. The lines that unambiguously mark the transition from one area to another are of course the ridge creases. Now, let's divide the areas bounded by the ridge crease in two groups. To make the whole process easier, we will color these areas in two colors, orange and blue. Bear in mind that two areas touching one another cannot be colored the same. That's why we need to color our crease pattern so that it resembles a chessboard. Look at our crease pattern. No areas of the same color touch one another. If we somehow found two areas that do, then there is something terribly wrong with our design. Most likely with ridge creases, there is definitively a mistake somewhere. This procedure allows us to almost automatically divide the crease pattern into areas of horizontal and areas of vertical axial creases. But again, there is one small problem. 
We still don't know which color, blue or orange, represents horizontal, and which color represents vertical axial creases. Be very careful with that. It is not all the same. In order to resolve this situation I suggest doing the following. Pick one flap, or more precisely its polygon, and try to define axial creases. This shouldn't be hard. Just remember this rule. Axial creases are always perpendicular to hinge creases. I'll repeat this rule once again. Axial creases are always perpendicular to hinge creases. Let's try to implement this rule. First we have to find where the hinge crease is. Can you see it? Now, we know for sure where axial creases should be. We know that axial creases coincide with the grid. Also we know that axial creases cannot intersect one another. And finally, we know that they have to be perpendicular to the hinge crease. So, there aren't many options left regarding where axial creases are supposed to be. As a matter of fact this is only possible option. Do you see the axial creases? Do you see how axial creases change their direction when they intersect a ridge crease? Exactly like I have told you. Now, we know which color represents which type of an axial crease. Blue areas contain horizontal and the orange areas contain vertical axial creases. Now we can fill the rest of the crease pattern with appropriate axial creases. I hope you agree that the axial crease defining procedure is quite simple and straightforward. Now that we have defined where hinge creases, ridge creases, and all axial creases are, our crease pattern is more or less complete. That's all for today. In the next episode we're gonna continue with the analysis of basic elements. Their orientation is what we're gonna deal with. We're gonna see what orientation is, how it is defined, and why it is important.